Good afternoon. I am Pete, also known as Risk for Rewards, or over on Twitter, known as at Risk for Rewards. Um, currently got around 20,000 followers over there and about 1,600 here on YouTube. If you do like the YouTube content, if you uh, click the link at the bottom to subscribe, it just means that it pops up on your phone or on your TV or whatever you're watching YouTube on um, whenever I promote a video straight away um, and you're not waiting around for it. Uh, a little bit slow on the video this week. Um, just because the more I thought about it, the more important the draw was. There was no good me telling you a list of horses for the derby and then the draw coming out and then me me saying, okay, I no longer fancy that horse for the derby, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to wait as long as possible. Now we've got as much information as possible so I can give you as much of the content as possible ready for this weekend's action. I'm not going to go back. I know obviously last week I said, oh, I'm going to go through York. I'll go through this and go through that. I did do a video. I recorded it. I uploaded it. I always listen to bits of my video back myself, but I just thought it was quite repetitive. And you're also, you're not getting the same numbers of people um, viewing videos um, with regard to the review of the week before. Um, if it's safe, uh, if we're going through the winter months and you're looking towards Cheltenham, everyone is wanting to watch those reviews because they want to back Cheltenham horses. They're all about Cheltenham, Aintree, Grand National, let's go here. Whereas for this, I think people don't fixate as far in the distance. You've got big ones this weekend with the Derby and the Oaks, and then you've got big ones again in um, with Royal Ascot. So no doubt next week, if you do a review of this weekend, and you're talking about Royal Ascot horses in two weeks' time, everyone's going to want to watch it. But if you're talking about Royal Ascot horses four weeks before, people just aren't as bothered. Mainly, in my opinion, it's down to the time of year. You look outside, it's sunny. Why do you want to sit outside and watch a load of review videos? In the winter, it's gloomy, it's wet. What are you going to do on a Sunday afternoon when you're hungover? Oh, I'll just flick through and watch that. Oh yeah, I fancy that horse. Back that for Cheltenham. Six months later, go collect 33 to 1. Cheers, easy. So, um, anyway... I digress. So I'm not going to go back and cover all these horses, like horses like Little Big Bear, Desert Crown, etc, 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 because Royal Ascot is coming. Only thing I am going to give you quickly is a quick rundown of uh, a few of my anti-post selections that I have got, um, just so people are aware of where we're going and, and where I'm at, and I've not lost faith with certain horses. Prince of Wales stakes, i still got full faith in Desert Crown. My biggest concern would be, will they go there, won't they go there? I'm not going to go into the run and stuff, but I have backed him. Whether you'd want to back him right now, I'd say no, because you don't know if he's going there or the Eclipse. And there's many question marks after his last run. No rush whatsoever, but I have backed it myself. Um, uh, Eldar Eldorov, 8-1 to one for the Gold Cup and Coltrane, 6-1 to one for the Gold Cup. They will be my two, unless there's non-runners or whatever. And then it will just be one of those. Those will not change. They are my Ascot Gold Cup horses. 4-1 to one and 7-2 to two currently. That will not change. Um and then that's about it for a current because of the fact that obviously we're at the derby weekend so there are going to be loads of ascot selections of course there will be i'll have ascot videos i'll try and take a, i've took time off work i'm going to be trying to put as much video content as possible i'll be putting um uh previews for the videos i'll be doing the um content a bit like a cheltenham blog but it'll be a lot less um content just because you cannot physically do it Cheltenham has 28 races of which I can start to work out now who's going to win those races from December from December 31st so as soon as they've run that uh, King George or after Boxing Day I start writing that Cheltenham blog because I can write profiles some horses don't come out again if you were doing that on the flat now you could have a horse that could run I don't know four times in the next four weeks you've still got horses that may well you, we may not have seen for Ascot and they may run two or three times also you don't get the information of who's running where you've got horses doubly entered in like the North Norfolk or the Queen Mary and the, and the Albany etc etc um, and you won't get that until 48 hours before so it's just not physically possible to keep up with it in that that sort of degree but I will have some sort of blog I will put up daily content obviously the guys will on the discord will get stuff first as as it's been seen before um, but I'll put as much as I, I normally do on Twitter which is obviously plenty for those that are the recreational viewers but if you want to get involved with Royal Ascot whether it's through the discord or if you're through here obviously that'll all be there however this is the weekend. This is the weekend we've been waiting for. This to me is, you've got 2,000 and 1,000 guineas um, and then it's bang into the derby. Um, and this is a big weekend. Big weekend for me, big weekend for everyone. And also not only that, is it's obviously tomorrow you've got the FA Cup final. They've moved to, not tomorrow, Saturday, sorry. FA Cup final and the Epsom derby on the same day, um, which is obviously, part of it's a frustrating because obviously, in my opinion, you like to have the derby later in the day. A lot of people will watch the first race 
watch a derby and then they might switch off. Whereas a lot of people like to build it up. They'll have a few multiples building into their derby horses. But at the end of the day, if you get the winner of the derby, then you just set up for the day. You can just be like, right, that's brilliant. Turn TV off, go out for your beers and go watch the FA Cup final. Or you can sit there and be like, do you know what? I can do a bit of this, bit of that. So at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world. Um, it just means they're trying to set it up so that we can all they can get maximum viewing figures and we can watch as much as possible. Anyway, let's get cracking. So Friday um obviously right so just before i go into this um right now it's thursday afternoon um the selections i have put selections out already on the discord the selections for tomorrow will go out tomorrow morning with the content the analysis and the four races covered so what i'm going to run through here is just i'm going to do exactly the same as i did for the entry grand national because it seems to work very well um for both the oaks and the derby i'm going to go through each individual horse in literally like a one-liner and then cover a few of the more favoured ones with a couple more and just basically say I'm going to be as honest as possible and say no, yes, no, yes. So am I going to be wrong? Probably at some point. But I was right with the Grand National with Carrot Rambler. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not going to sit on the fence and be like, oh, that might not stay, that might not happen. So I'm not sure how that'll be. I'll just straight up tell you that in my view. So if you want to put in the comments and come at me, if you want to put in the comments, put who you think is going to win the um, both of those two races, the Oaks and the Derby. Throw it up there. This is this would be my double, etc. Or if you really want brave, go for the three and get the coronation. But I don't think that really counts as the other two. Um, but at the end of the day, I'll put my opinion up there. I'm going to be wrong on some of them. Of course I am, because uh, some will stay, some won't stay. We are guessing. And at the end of the day, this is a bit like going back to National Hunt, because a lot of people watch more of that. It's a bit like the Supreme Novice sort of era, in the fact that a lot of these horses may have had two, three, four, five runs. Some only on heavy ground, some only on good ground. So it's up to you how you want to vary your stakes, because you have not got an awful lot of information. A lot of it you're going on, a lot of people are going on is pedigree, stamina index, um, trainer ability to target a race, um, brothers, sisters in the family, horses like Adia, um, and obviously um, f current form you've got, but most of it's from two year old form. So a lot of it you're going on is from last year. So anyway, right, let's get to it. So Friday, two o'clock, I'm not going to go into the, um, uh, the uh, Woodcock. It's a trappy race, I'm not a fan of it. I am, however, going to go into the Lotto Handicap. So the Lotto Handicap is a one mile uh, and a half furlong uh, race. I had a scan through here. There's plenty to like around the front end of the market. All the King's Men has been put in favour by, in my opinion, by default. Two is one because George Bowie is one of the best target trainers of handicaps. I say that he's obviously a very young and inexperienced trainer, but from what we've seen, he's very good. He obviously picking up Royal Ascot winners is very, very big straight away. Um, but... He's got this horse, uh, All the King's Men. He won this last year with Totally Charming, who then went on to Royal Ascot. Um, but this horse doesn't really strike me as a Totally Charming. So you've got one of two ways of looking at this. Either George Bowie is doing a George Bowie in the fact that he's hiding this horse very, very well because like he's come third, second, third. There's nothing. There's no form around it, as in with the winners and stuff, that makes it stand out to say, oh, he's very unlucky there, or that horse was really well in. And it's just ticking along. If, if I click it, I think it's improved two pounds. Yeah, 87 to 89 in three runs. So to me, either he's hiding something very, very well, but that may be for Royal Ascot, that might not be here, or this horse is just underpriced because of the connections. Either way, you're not going to know until he runs. And as a five to one favourite of the race, he's just one that I'd pass over. Ross Colin is the obviously complete obvious one um, in the fact that has one... Won a, won a race here before, however, that race was 21 starts ago. Um, since then, has not won, has ran very well at much higher levels than this, achieved much higher RPRs, and has dropped and dropped and dropped down the weights. And is currently now, I think he's, he's on 95, I think he won off 92. Yeah, he won off 92. So he's only three pounds above his, higher, his highest mark, but he has ran to numbers of 104s, 109s. This season, he's just put up two complete no-shows, an eighth out of 11 and a tenth of 22. But again, that could be by design because they're targeting this race because of the fact that this is the one track that he's won at. If that is the case, if he's on a going day, if David O'Mara's got him spot on, then obviously he's going to be tough to beat. At the same time, he's still three pounds above that winning mark and he hasn't won in 21 starts. So for me, he's still fairly short in the market at 11 to 2. But I can see all the reasons why he would bounce back and he could win this race. So next up, the two that I think are the most interesting. One is Dutch Decoy. 
um, especially with obviously the Johnstons. You saw the Johnstons at Goodwood bouncing, not bouncing back, but this is they're starting to fire in. And when they start going, they just run their handicappers every three, four, five days, and it's like bang, win, bang, win. Um, and this horse has got great form on the on the faster services, um, but. At the same time, the market has moved this one horse. This, I think he was nine to one. He's now into sixes. So I'm not saying pass him over, but I just think there's a horse. He is what he is, if that makes sense. So as in Dutch decoy, he's not leaving much. This, the opposite to the George Bowie horse. He's not leaving much. As in, you can see exactly what he is. He runs to his level on good fast ground over the trip. Um, so, okay, he's a player um, and he's got good form. Um and he's got good form finishing the first four. So he's a good each way bet. But he's not the one for me. So that leaves us on to the next two, which we go further down. And that's Fantastic Fox and Revich. So these two, the reason I cover them both together is because they kind of interlink and they're a similar price, six to one and 13 to two. And much like Ross Colin, if Fantastic Fox has had this as the plot and laid out and, and this is the plan from Roger Varian, then he's going to go very close. And the reason that could be the case is because Fantastic Fox ran here last year in this race behind Totally Charming. Ran on, staying on third, um, off a mark of 98. Comes here off £5 lower. The reason he comes here off £5 lower is because after that, he's finishing last. He finished 29th of 29th. He ran a fair race, but still beaten seven lengths at Newbury. He then finished 10th of 10. He ran a quite a solid race um, here at Epsom, getting fitness, I'd imagine, over 10 furlongs behind Bad Company. And I think that form will work out very well. So just going on to that, because obviously this brings on to other selections later in the weekend. Bad Company beating Chaos Chorister, Soto Sizzler. Um, Scampi was in fifth, so behind Fantastic Fox. And Scampi obviously won the big York handicap. So that form is strong. Um, but then came out of Chester and was well beaten again. So he's now dropped to a mark that is £5 lower than when finishing third. So why is that interesting? Well, one, because obviously they, there's a strong chance of their target in this race. Um, but Roger Varian doesn't strike me as the, the target trainer. He has had Royal Ascot handicap winners. But that's interesting because in second place that day was Revich. So these are going to be similar conditions. It was good ground last year. It'll probably be good ground again um, tomorrow. Um, and the reason why Revich is interesting is because Revich finished second. And it wasn't like Fantastic Fox was closing and was going to go past him. I think Revich should have been got going earlier and should have been close to the winner so fantastic fox was getting um on that on that day fantastic fox was giving revich three pounds but today revich is giving fantastic fox five pounds so that's an eight pound swing in fantastic fox's favor so i know most people are probably thinking oh it's gonna fantastic fox will be a selection but that's a no um the actual selection is revich why because Revich is coming off here off a career, he's on a career high mark, but he's coming off for a career best. I had no bets at Chester bar one bet, which was Revich. Um, I didn't put it on Twitter, it did go in Discord, um, and it, that was my only selection. And he's not, the reason why I didn't want to, you know, put it everywhere and be like, is because he's only got six wins in 39 runs. And also, he was another who hadn't had a win for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 12 runs, he hadn't had a win, so or 11 runs, he ran on one on the 12th. But on that day, everything was lined up, as in the mark was, his mark was back to a winning mark of 92. Um, he likes the cut, but he also goes well on good ground. He handled Chester before, and everything looked right for him to run a big race, and he looked very good in his two starts. That's the difference between some of these handicappers. Some of them, they're happy to just roll around at 8th, 10th, or whatever at the back, and just let the handicapper drop them down. And then some, they show you a little bit, but not enough, so that they might get a few pounds down. Revich, for me, um, was, on this day, uh, was very, very good, as in, Missed the, missed the kick I thought he had a good draw so he'd get out bounce out and he'd almost make all or be very prominent he kind of missed the kick ended up stuck in the middle the gap opened he took it and he was gone won very easy from Witch Hunter three lengths who is a 103 rated horse obviously he's getting weight from the horse but still it's no no back back number so he ran in this race last year and obviously he comes here off a higher mark so that higher mark from last year he ran here off 95, which was three pounds higher than what he won off. And he runs off three pounds higher than that. So technically he's three. So he, he's gone up six pounds, but he's three pound higher than he was last year. So the difference is this year is the fact that they've swapped jockeys. So last year 
he ran under Jim Crowley. And this year he runs under Ryan Moore. So, OK, yeah, he's gone up three pounds. But if you said to me, would I swap three pounds for Ryan Moore from Jim Crowley? This is nothing on Jim Crowley. It's something on Ryan Moore. I take it. So, OK, that, that's got nothing to do with it. That isn't the why, obviously, he's gone up or anything like that. But it's the fact is that the bottom line is he's running off a three pound higher mark than last year when finishing second in this race. When running a very good race. And if he was got after earlier, he may have gone close to winning it. He's coming here off a career high best. So he's got a 106 RPR. They nearly ran him under a penalty because they wanted to make use of that mark. But they've saved him for this race. And the biggest thing of all is the fact he's got Epsom form. He's got a first and a second place as his two runs here at Epsom. And that is massive. Epsom form all this week does not matter on the race. That's massive. So Revit is a selection. I've just realised I've spoke way too long considering we had to talk about the Oaks and the Derby. So I am going to speed it up. Right, so on to the Coronation Cup. This is going to be quick. This is a field full of quirk bags. So they are quirky horses. The money's coming for this Toons, um, which I can see the case for. He's got similar levels of form to the rest. However, all his form's coming with soft in the title. People are backing him because they don't know what to back from the other end. So that's why I think he's going to end up probably a seven or eight to one shot. Um, but I, I don't think he's going to be as good as at least one of these. Point Lonsdale for me, he's drifting out to a more normal price of what I expect him to be. He's out to 11 to 2 now. Um, he's most unexposed, but he's not run at this trip. He's not got the stats all points having at least eight runs. He's very inexperienced. The only thing going for him is the fact his trainer has won this with the likes of St. Nicholas Abbey, so he'd know what it would take. And this would be like his group one for the year. Like if he can get if he can get the win here, that is his that would be his be all and end all, in my opinion. He will be ripe and prime for this. However, he was off the bridle very early at Chester, and that would concern me against three very strong travelling horses with a turn of foot. Hurricane Lane is fitted with the second time cheap pieces. So obviously last year was a complete blank washout in the fact that he ran he ran third in the hard wick and they said he'd come on and that was behind Broom. You should be beating Broom over 12 furlongs if you're a top group one notcher. He then went to a trial and was absolutely whomped behind Alpinista over in France on soft ground and he was very poor. He came back this year, he was seventh for seven, very poor again. Um, however, last time out he beat... Uh, West Wind Blows, I think it was, or blow, something like that, um, who's a good horse, but I think he's a Group 1 or a listed winner at best. Uh, group 1. Group 3, or I think he might even be a, a listed winner. Basically, he's not this level. He's not Group 1 standard. So whilst that was obviously good to see him back and back to his best, and they've rated him as if that was a top-level performance, like on sectionals, times and everything, and the cheek pieces clearly worked. One, can he back it up second time round? And two, is he still at that same level? So he's got questions to answer and at four to one. And obviously the only concern is that as well, the yard's not in great form, but I'm not going to go too much into that because a lot of people dive in on the yard. But when you're on group one, when you're at group one levels and you've got, say, a hurricane lane, you, it's hard to compare them to like, say, I don't know, five handicappers and three two year olds they've got at home because the the top, top group one horses, a lot of them still run to their level. It's not guaranteed because in, in effect, in a group one, you don't just want 100%, you want that 102%. So like looking at Point Lonsdale, like O'Brien's horses last week, they would they literally won everything. So that's that's the difference in the form. Uh, Emily Upjohn is very quirky again and comes here with similar risks attached to Hurricane Lane and the fact she's now in second time head gear. So her and Westover ran absolutely no race in the King George last year at Ascot. Um, for whatever reason, that's the only, on both of theirs, it's just the only complete flop, the complete bomb out that they both had. They were both too keen, both pulled too hard. It was like someone had set fireworks off in their barn um, because both of them ran no race whatsoever. Um, however, she she is clearly very, very talented, but the race she won at Ascot at the end of the year was Phillies only. Um, she was very, very good when second to Tuesday here, but Tuesday was then absolutely whomped by Westover in the Irish Derby after that. So she has the form to feature here and to play a big part um, but at the same time she's got question marks um, this is not a, going on the stats again this is not a good race of fillies and mares um, and also not fillies and mares rated at her level and it's also really not a good stat for horses that have not run in the last 70 days or or this season at all which she hasn't they could be using this as a prep to take the edge off her ready for royal ascot so again it's it's a quirk it's a chink um, and she was obviously three to one but she's been backed 
and I'll tell you that now, the, the Frankie factor. Like for me personally, I love it because there's not many of Frankie's rides that I'm going to be like diving into. But currently you're seeing a lot of them getting backed and it'll be the same at Royal Ascot. They're all going to get backed because it's his last time. Just because it's his last time. It's like watching the relegation in the football. Just because they need to win doesn't mean they're going to win. Just because Frankie wants to win doesn't mean he's going to. I mean, he could win the Coronation and both the Derby and the Oaks. Has he ever done that before? No. But is he going to be back like he could do that? Yes, of course he is. So... She's got a strong chance, but she's got her quirks. Then on to Westover. Westover, I think he's a fair price, which is a difference. I think nine to four is about his price. The difference for Westover is Westover does have a tendency to boil over. He was in a muck of sweat out in Dubai. Um, even in the in getting ready for the derby, you were a little bit concerned. But obviously there was a lot of fireworks and stuff last year, which people couldn't understand why you would do that. Um, but he's still, on, on these occasions, even when he gets himself in a massive tiz fit, he still runs massive races. Like his the, his third behind Desert Crown shows his handle his ability to handle the track, which obviously Emily Upjohn has as well. Hurricane Lane has Hurricane Lane third in the Derby, Emily Upjohn second in the Oaks. So they've all got good form those front three um, at the track, which is again what you need to look out for. Um, but Westover was solid last year. He finished. Um, he demolished them in the in the um, Derby, beating Pisba Deal. And that's no back number, but he still wanted him seven lengths. Tuesday was back ten lengths, who just won the Oaks. She probably didn't run a race, but at the same time, still good form for him. He then went to Ascot and ran no race. And that's your one concern here is I think some of these will not run a race. And that's the problem. Emily Upjohn, Hurricane Lane, second time uh, headgear and equipment. Um, and Westover, I always get concerned with that, that going back to that. Um, but he does have the best form in the race with recent form as well. He's got a run within the last 70 days when finishing a big run behind Equinox. If he can get Westover settled in the pack and he can get him out running down the straight in a tiny field, you shouldn't be getting boxed in in a field this size, um, then he's got to have a solid chance. And at 9-4, to four, I think he's worth a bet. I don't think he's worth a massive bet. I just think he's worth a normal bet. Um, I think it's a very tricky race and it wouldn't surprise me if any of the five won. Uh, not going to go into the Betford Handicap. And then we're on to the big one, the Oaks. So, right, let's go for the Oaks. Um, we're going to do it in price order, but in reverse price order. So we'll start with Sea of Roses. For me, uh, Drawn and Stall 1 um, is just a no-go for me. Um, well, not no-go. That's very not very nice. But the fact that she was obviously laying up with the likes of... Um, basically, she was well beaten in the Musadora. And I just don't think she's at the level to the rest of these. Um, that would apply again the same with Bright Diamond. Mama June is my outsider of the field. I do like her. I put her, well, I say I put her up. I haven't put her up yet. She's um, 50, 50 to 1. If you can get each way, like extended places, 4, 5, 6 places or whatever, like all these crazy things they do on places like Bet365. If you want a fun bet, like a once a year sort of bet, and you don't want to be looking at the favourites, she was travelling really, really well behind Gather Your O's Buds, but she just got swamped in the ground. She's got a great pedigree for this race. Um, stamina will be no issue. Faster ground should suit. And I just think, obviously, completely inexperienced. It'd almost be unheard of for a horse to come in as a maiden on second start and win. But she could run well and run into a place at 50 to 1. Um, Red Riding Hood uh, isn't one for me. Um, Cairn of Fun, I'm not 100% sure she, uh, she will stay. Ran a good race in the 2000 Guineas. Um, but you'd also question, is she quite up to this level? Um, be happy was very well backed in the Lingfield trial, but I find it hard to rate that Lingfield trial like that. They all finish in a heap, um, eternal hope and be happy, um, on top of each other. Um, and again, it's hard to envisage them, them two, despite connections, either eternal hope or, um, and then heartache tonight's been a bit of a springer. People have been talking about this horse, but I don't really see it myself. Like as in like, Beaten two out of three starts, been running on soft and very soft ground. Um, and talking that she's further ahead than wonderful tonight and stuff like that. But okay, she's got form of 102 two RPRs, which would put her close. But maybe it's just the fact that I'm so set on the, the front three in the market. Like to, to put this to put this simply and to put it in simple terms obviously i haven't got the stats here i've, I've wrote the blog already but i haven't got them here in front of me um, because obviously i want to interact rather than just be sat here and reading everything off the thing for you but to put it simply aiden o'brien has won eight of the last ten uh oaks and the ones he hasn't won have won, been won by john gosden o'brien's won three of the last three four of the last five and between uh He's won four of the last six and Gosden's won the other two. 
So, I mean, if you're looking at O'Brien, one, two, three, four, he's won four of the last, uh, six of the last eight Oaks and Gosden's won the other two. And as I've said a million times, when it's Phillies and Mayors, the port of call is always those two trainers. They are the best, unquestionably. Um, don't get me wrong, Joseph seems to be sneaking in there and getting very good, but um, they are the best. So on to the three main contenders. Obviously, unfortunately, the price does tell you that. Um, uh, running Lion. Running Lion, I thought, looked brilliant when winning at Newmarket. Um, that was really comprehensive. Um, uh, comprehensive best way of wording it um basically it was almost like a bit of a surprise because for whatever reason i don't know whether he doesn't show a lot at home but gosden campaigned him very unprogressively as if he was going to be like an all-weather maybe like a, a a thursday or friday horse rather than a saturday horse in the fact that he's he's starting him off at newmarket he was beaten but then uh, she went to lingfield won very easily but then went to chelmsford won very easily and then next thing she's coming back and she's starting at kempton so like running on the all weather tracks, it says, OK, that's not really he does like to do that with maybe the first or second run. But then after that, he tends to let, obviously they move on to the Saturday cards and the big tracks. So but she got a chance and um, and she took it with both hands in the Pretty Polly. And the Pretty Polly is a good trial for this. I think it's two of the last 12 winners have come from the Pretty Polly. Um, but unfortunately, the horse she beat, Sumo Sam, absolutely bombed. But the, at the end of the day, Phillies and Mares do. So it's not something to, to knock her with. She looked very good in winning. The main concern is obviously she's by Roaring Lion, and um, as soon as as soon as she got off, you look at the. In fact, I'm not even going to go into the quotes, but uh, Murphy's always in Murphy, always in Oshin. So I don't know how to say it. His first comments as soon as he got off was that she's a ten furlong horse. I think it's the Diane, the one where Blue Rose sends favourite four over in France, which is the French Oaks over two furlong short. Will be right up her street. They were all about that. And then went and spoke to obviously John Gosden. He said, yeah, that, that may well be the case. But as always, there's only one Epsom Oaks. So it's better to, a bit like the 2000 Guineas. A lot of these horses will be Derby horses, but they run them in the Guineas because there's only one Guineas. Give it a try. If it works, it doesn't matter. That's the difference between flat and jumps as well. They don't lose anything by trying. So if she loses here, she may still have enough time to recover and then go and race in the uh, Diane anyway. So the, to keep it short is the fact that he was concerned about the trip and he said that when he was on Roaring Lion in the Derby, um, he was all over the wind. As in he felt like he was travelling on the strongest horse. But then once he got to that the stamina test, the horse not cut out, but just didn't have that extra stamina to go with the, the, the rest of them. Um, and that could well be the case here with Running Lion. Can't guarantee that. Not saying it definitely will be. Um, but that, that could be the case. Um, so then on to the top two in the market. And I think these two are very, very difficult to split. Um, so when it comes down to that, most people will say, well, surely you just take the bigger price. But one, fortunately, it was made slightly easier in the fact that Soul Sister's got a worse draw. So she's out in 10. It's not a massive field, 11 horses. And she's obviously going to sit from the back. Um, but she has got a lot of ground to come across and merge in. Whereas if she'd drawn, like, say, four or five, she could have just come straight out. They would have come in, closed her into the pack, and that would have been easy for her. So she is covering extra ground, especially for a horse who's not going to be intending to go across them prominently. Um Soul Sister, I think she's got question marks. Obviously, she's by Frankel, by... Again, I'm going off the top of my head, so let me have a look. Frankel by Dream Peace. So, Frankel obviously never went further than the 10 furlongs, but some of his progeny have had success with 12 furlongs already. So, it's not guaranteed, um, but the more the things that stood out more for me was the fact that they, they had her over a mile. She won very well on debut. She came back, she started over seven furlongs which was a bit of an alarm bell. If you're thinking this horse is an Oaks horse, why are you starting over seven furlongs? She completely bombed there, but they put that down to the ground and I could see that. And then she ran an absolutely identical race in the Musadora on the faster ground over 10 furlongs. The only difference was, was when the taps were turned on and not physically tapped, as in when the gears were asked for by Frankie, this time they well and truly came through. Whereas last time he gave the nudge, nothing came out. Whereas this time on the good ground, she really picked up for him. The question, a lot of people are saying that's way better form than save the last dance, as in on the form lines. But no Novakai obviously set a high standard finishing second behind commission in the group one last year. But you take that out and then it's no different to like many of the others in the fact that she's just beaten horses that have won one race. So like the Arctic, Co uh, Infinite Cosmos and horses like that. So there isn't a lot between her and save the last dance. So how, how do you split them? Well, then you go across to Save the Last Dance and Save the Last Dance. A lot of people are getting worried about the ground. 
like all her forms are soft and heavy. But you look at her her pedigree and her pedigree. She's by um, Scat Daddy. It's not Scat Daddy. Daddy's little darling, who's um, an American American Oaks winner. American Oaks is over a shorter trip, so it's over the uh, twelve. Uh, T- 10 furlongs the extended 10 furlongs but she's also placed uh, second in um, the 12 furlongs as well um, so and obviously Galileo won the derby who she's also by so to, to me her being a Galileo out of um, daddy's little darling she's got plenty in it she's got plenty in her favor as well and that is where the whole I've got no issue with the good ground because of the fact that if you're if you can run on pretty much concrete if in her pedigree she's got the ability to run in concrete, then she may even not just be able to handle the ground, but she might actually improve for this faster ground. The strange thing with both these horses is for yards that normally know the time of day and which horses are their best, neither of them were very well fancied. So like as in, obviously, Soul Sister was still sent off 18 to 1 last time out. And and Save the Last Dance was sent off 20 to 1 first time out this year. Yeah, she was sent off at 8 to 11 at Chester, but that race was absolutely awful. Like you go through it now and the second horse gave away about eight lengths at the start. So, but forgetting about that run, the initial run that she had when coming back, she beat Boogie Woogie, who's gone across to France and placed in a, uh, I think it was a group three, a group three. Yeah, in it. No, no, it was a group one. She didn't place, she finished, um, she finished uh, sixth in uh, a group one over there. She wasn't given a hard time, but she won since by five lengths. The same with Azazat. Azazat broke her maiden afterwards and won by like five lengths. So they're not trees, but the ones at Chester, perhaps they were trees. That was a very easy, facile victory. And it was obviously overly extended by the ground. But at the same time, the sectional boys were purring, the clock was ticking. Everything about that Oaks performance was massive. So the, the real question is, it's like the the Stoke City on a Monday night. Can she do it on fast ground at Epsom on a quirky track over 12 furlongs? Difference is for Save the Last Dance is she's proven over 12 furlongs. She's obviously won over 11 and a half furlongs on pretty much bottomless ground at Chester. So the ability to stay 12 furlongs should be of no issue. She was getting nudged along a little, but it was a bit like an old school Kieran Fallon, not young Fallon, old Fallon, where Ryan was like nudging her in just to, but at the end of the day, the horse was on her third start. So, and every time he was doing it, she was just nursing back into the bridle and finding more and more. And then once he come up along the outside, it was like, how far is this going to win by? And obviously 22 lengths. And that's 22 lengths to second place, not obviously all the other horses further back. And I, I agree, the form of that is very poor. But at the, at the same time, I think every now and again, you get one where they could be superstars. And Save the Last Dance could be a superstar. Soul Sister could be a superstar. A lot of people are writing off this Oaks already. Me personally, Save the Last Dance... If she's to win here, um, where's the ne- where's the next logical step, which you should probably be looking at towards the end of the year? I'm not going to give you it, but if we were going abroad and I was looking for bottomless ground, there's a pretty obvious target towards the end of the year. And if she wins this, then she'll probably be favourite for that race afterwards. So my, my preference is quite firmly in the Save the Last Dance. I'm not going to be surprised if Soul Sister, but I think she's got more to prove on the stamina front. She looks too quick to be able to stay that with true stamina, as I've got a feeling we might see something very good from Save the Last Dance tomorrow. Right then, on to 5.10, the Surrey Stakes. Obviously, Hull Green's can be tough to beat, but I don't like a horse when they've got so many seconds next to their name. Um, not saying he won't win, I just like I didn't want to get involved in that race. So here's one that I really did like, is um, Urban Sprawl. So Urban Sprawl, for anyone who was on the pain last Saturday at Goodwood, I put up Yao Kalef, and who was the other horse? Uh, Yalkalef and Tafridge. Those two look incredibly well handicapped horses. And I was correct in that process, but you don't get paid for finishing second and a third. And they didn't and they finished second and third, so this horse, Urban Sprawl. Obviously every time a horse goes to um uh, Goodwood, they sprout wings for the uh, Johnson yard. And that's exactly what this horse did. Fast ground from the front. But the difference was he didn't steal the race. He set good sectionals, he raced efficiently, and he won like as in it, it was good proven form as in it wasn't he, he didn't steal it which is why i think it's this is i i could see this horse going off three to one or five to two tomorrow um it's currently priced at between four to one and five to one you can still get five to one each way three four places um might even go up to five places um 
And if he can repeat the form, which obviously a lot of Johnson's horses can do five or six days later under only the six pound penalty, um, I think Yalkalef is one of the best handicapped horses and, and will be a big player at uh, Royal Ascot, um, depending on what he, what they end up entering him in. Um, so if Urban Sport can repeat that sort of form, then he's easily the one to beat. And I'm, I'm not going to go through it because I have gone through it myself. Um, but just to look at a lot of the other horses in here, um, yeah, obviously, as always with a handicap, it's hard working out who's this is their target sort of thing. And Urban Spool doesn't have form here at Epsom. But looking at last year's race and looking at previous races, it favours frontrunners. He's in draw six. He could come out, bounce out. And if he can get that front easy lead and he, and he gets a nice toe, I could easily see him kicking off down the home straight. And if he's got enough in hand still with the six extra pounds under, under Fanning, um, good ground again the track will hopefully suit he didn't look a complicated horse and if he saved plenty then four or five to one could look a big price come uh, 5.45 tomorrow so that is the Friday so let's have a quick recap 2.35 Revich from an each way perspective 3.10 Westover but that's more by just a selection rather than the fact that really firm on him um, 4.30 the Epsom Oaks I like Save the Last Dance um, and obviously you may want to look at further targets and obviously my man June 50 to 1 but that's more of like just a, f a bit of fun um, 5.45 Urban Sprawl again an each way play right then on to Saturday so Saturday what do we have I'll try and be quicker I know I talk too much um, let's go to well straight into the Derby because it's 1.30 right Derby We'll go similar. 100 to 1, um, dear my friend, not for me. Adelaide River gets good ground for the first time, which is better for the pedigree, but at the same time, well beaten by arrest twice. I don't think you have the form. King of Steel, very interesting for Roger Varian. Very strange to have a horse coming here off no starts this year, two starts last year, and at 50 to 1. And Roger Varian isn't in it extremely like striking form to make me want to go out and smash into that horse. Um, San Antonio from store 12 um, it's one of those where it's O'Brien it like the serpentine type where they've done it but they've not set the world alight they've achieved RPRs that are like say 109, 110s that would feature in a derby but they'd need to improve like £10 sometimes they do, sometimes they don't my gut feeling is at least one of these out of San Antonio and Adelaide River is going to be a pacemaker for August Road in so which one it'll be, I don't know, but it just makes me not want to get involved. Every now and again, you get a Serpentine who wins, then you're on the wrong side of it, but it is what it is. Artistic Star, I was on when uh, beat uh, Torito, um, but at the same time, Torito's uh, one of the favourites for a handicap later on in the day. So if you've got Torito as one of the favourites for the handicap, I mean, don't get me wrong, if Artistic Star goes really well here, you want to be back in Torito later in the day in a handicap. But Connection said that, uh, the plan was to go to a trial to see where they were at with this horse. Um, the, the trial, I think, got cancelled or moved and they've ended up winning at Sandown, but they're not sure if this is going to come too soon. But I just think it's got too much. Like, I mean, you're looking at Aidan O'Brien horse, uh, one of his back numbers, and that's still got 109 RPRs. That's £10 higher than what Artistic Star achieved. So Wapiro. So Wapiro is one of my outsiders for the... Um, Derby, um, mainly because I just think one, there's no question mark. I haven't got all the pedigrees lined in front of me. They will all be on my stats that I put up to uh, Saturday morning. But I've already looked at Wipiro. Stamina won't be an issue. Um, staying won't be an issue. Um, and he's an interesting horse. But I think a lot of it that I'm the reason why I'm drawn into this is because I'm a big fan of military order. But I thought he did nothing wrong in his. Um, on his prep, obviously one first time out and then at Lingfield was impressive enough. Like as in they got on a nice ding dong. And like if you said to me, like, let's have a stupid forecast. Say you're sat in the pub with your mates, let's have like a pound forecast on something. And like military order and Wapiro would be probably my my forecast. Like it would pay massive because Wapiro might go off, I don't know, 25, 33 to 1 on the day. Um, and also if, if military order was to win, Wapiro might not be far behind. Um, I, I, I just can't see... And turning the form around, unless something was to go wrong, and military orders drawn the better stall. But at the same time, obviously, only three runs, very unexposed. Tom Marquand takes over, so and he won on him before. So I think Wipiro is, is a dark horse for this race. Um, White Birch is a horse of interest, but I just I just can't see it myself. Um, I thought mainly the run style. There's no guarantee on staying, and also the run style. I, I don't like a horse that 
keeps coming from the back. Like if you watch, obviously the beating of Up and Under is fair. That lines up with Sprawl, the other Irish runner. Um, but they're both beating the same horses. But came across to the Dante and ran a brilliant race in the Dante. But the Dante was just such a mess of a race. Like I saw someone put up saying, oh, we've got a massive bunch of really good horses. And in my opinion, when horses finish in a heap, it's almost impossible to say that sort of thing because how can you say like that was a really good Dante and they're all going to be good horses? What? So suddenly we've got a bunch of like eight really, really good horses of which some have very modest two-year-old form. I think, in my opinion, part of it is the fact that one, it's a trial, so not all of them will be fit. They're all using it for different purposes. And um, two, the race was run in all different ways. Like he came down the outside and I think that's why I could see him at Epsom coming down the outside and shooting down the, at the outside. They've got the uh, Irish best jockey on and Colin Keane coming over for it problem is he's drawn in stall two so for a horse that's probably if he's drawn in stall two he's going to take a pull um because he's, he's not he's a hold-up horse so he's probably going to come from last and have to loop the whole field and that to me is a massive ask it's all very well trying to do it in a dante when plenty of them are having like a run for experience but trying to do that in a derby is, an, is another thing if he wins then it'll be one of those take your hat off because it will look impressive especially as a big gallant gray but not for me the buy mile, in my opinion, is the other dark horse. So if you're someone who's coming to this, obviously I'm going to come to my selections of who I backed. But if you're coming to this and you're a one-time derby watcher, like say like the Grand National, and you're like, I don't want to back a short-priced horse. I want to back something like much bigger price. Like my two outsider dark horses will be Dubai Mile and Waipira. The reason for both of them is that they're both bigger prices is because they've been beaten. They're not as the sexy. Like Waipira got beaten by military order and Dubai Mile, got beaten in the 2000 guineas but at the same time i just cannot get my head round like when i look at when i look at the um two seconds let me just load this up so when i look at the um the the difference between the dubai mile and arrest so dubai mile uh obviously just a quick run through dubai miles form S two two comprehensive wins of three and then met the foxes in an absolute mess of a race at newmarket it was one of those where you could finish first or you could finish fourth and it just happened that the foxes landed at the right time and won. However, Dubai Mile, they went to St. Clue on 10 furlongs heavy ground. And I thought Arrest got the perfect ride that day from Frankie Dettori. In fact, it might, I'm not sure it was Frankie actually. Um, but basically, no, it was Robert Havlin. I had a feeling it wasn't Frankie. Um, and, and they came around and they, they it was heavy ground and everything went right for Arrest. He hit the front and at three furlongs out, he should have kicked on and he did, but then Dubai Mile came back to him. And then both of them sat there for about two furlongs where they just stayed about a length ahead of the pack. They couldn't get any further and they just like that, ding dong, ding dong. And in the last furlong, it was like the rest gave up rather than they were going faster. And then they just went forwards and then Dubai Mile outstayed a rest, like heads up, heads down. So obviously that was on heavy ground. The Dubai Mile is another who is out of Roar and Lion. So there's no guarantee on the stay in front. But... Uh, I think it's Royal Line out of Beach Bunny. But at, at, at the same time, um, there's nothing to say he won't. But he's gone for a prep in the 2000 Guineas, of which was an absolute mess of a race itself. As in, like, that form has not worked out very well. Well, I say not worked out very well. It's just a mess all round, uh, bar, the, bar the winner at the moment. Um, but Caldean Cal obviously won, but that was by five and a quarter lengths. So this horse was being ridden for a preparation for the Derby and was one of very few in the 2000 Guineas doing that. Everyone else was trying to win the race. Um... And I just thought it was a very solid prep for the race. And if you're looking at arrest, let me scroll to arrest. So arrest is 11 to 2. So this horse is three times the price of that horse. Okay, the, the stats aren't in his favour because it's something like eight. I think it's eight out of the ten. Eight of the last ten, I think, have been drawn. Basically, six six and below isn't great, and the car park isn't great, and he's drawn in five. But it's not the end. Of, it's not the end of the world. Not the be all and end all. Horses will have one from five. Um, but I just think as an outsider, I think if you're looking at a rest, then it's hard not to say that Dubai Mile, obviously different connections, that Dubai Mile can't have a chance as well. And connections, Charlie Johnson, they've had um, Charlie and Mark Johnson, they've had big priced um, horses place in the um, derby before. So on to the Foxes. Foxes reminds me of Caldean in the fact that he's done everything right, but everyone's just dismissing. Like when I say Caldean, I mean for the 2000 guineas. Like he's won plenty of races. He obviously beat Dubai Mile. He was second to Indestructible on return and then he's won the Dante. The difference between him and Pastor in the Dante was his jockey took the initiative when they both met up alongside. He took the initiative and said, see you later, I'm not waiting around. Whereas obviously 
the jockey on pasture. I'm not going to go into it. Like he took a pull and just thought, oh, I'll wait, I'll wait, and um, and they got they got the job done. The the problem is again is Murphy is not a man who keeps himself to himself. He got he's since stated again. He said he's not sure if the horse is going to stay the trip. So if the horse stays the trip, then obviously he'll be a big player. I just think he's going to find one or two like a little bit classier or a little bit better. But if he crosses the line in front, it would just be one of those where you just say you knew it already, but you you just didn't want to back him. Sprawl, I was quite hot on um, in the fact of I like the, the Harrington Yarder in fair form. Um, ties in with Birch, uh, White Birch, in the fact that uh, Sprawl beat up and under three lengths. Uh, White Birch beat that rival by only about half a length. If you're putting that in collateral, I know it doesn't work like that. Well, White Birch finished second in the Dante, which means Sprawl doesn't have much to find with the connections here. Um, and that was going to be one of my outsiders, but drawn six it looks a horse that takes some cajoling and if you're drawn in six you're gonna to have to be quite quick away and it's going to be difficult to like as in it was a horse in both his runs when when winning both times was give it a nudge goes a bit give it a nudge goes a bit and also on softer heavy ground only had the one run at 10 furlongs the plus side is the fact that the horses that for O'Brien that have won that stuff like Bolshoi Ballet were sent off like five to four or, or odds on for this race, whereas Sprawl has been sent off 11 to one. So perhaps overlooked. So as an outsider chance, but I just think others perhaps maybe have better chances. I wouldn't say definitely can't win. Uh, on to a rest. Obviously, Frankie factors back in full flow. This horse went into like four or five to one. Well, about four to one favourite after Chester. Back out to seven or eight to one. Now back into 11 to two. Wouldn't surprise me if come Derby time, if Frankie picks up the Coronation or the Oaks tomorrow, uh, wouldn't surprise me if this horse is close to four to one. Um, again, the mention of uh, Dubai Mile. So, beaten on debut behind Nostrum. Um, two solid runs. But again, this very strange campaigning, a bit like running line in the fact that went to Sandown, which you'd expect, but then went to Foss Lass on good soft ground, sent off one to six. So I'd have to think that was for fitness. Then went to St. Clou, ran a brilliant race, no issue with that whatsoever, but was beaten by Dubai Mile, outstayed in a stamina battle. Um, and then obviously soft ground, destroyed Adelaide River at um, Chester, but had already destroyed Adelaide River at St. Clou. So we've learned nothing really. My concern with uh, arrest is one, he's drawn in the car park now. So that's definitely not a positive for a horse that's not going to want to come out and just bounce across. He's going to have to tuck in behind. All his form has got, uh, well, not all of his form because he has one on good to firm and sand down, but connections have been very strong and most of his form is on the um, on the softer surface, um, which would say to me that will he want anything faster than this? He is again, he's another Frankel. Um, and I just think like, ho like further down the line that, this horse has got big pots in him, but it just doesn't strike me as this. And that's the vibes you're getting from connections. A bit like running lion. Goslin is so keen. Sometimes he downplays his horses as in because he downplays his best ones because he gets nervous about them, like when he's interviewed about them. But sometimes he seems quite genuine in the way he's downplaying this one. And this one seems similar. And you watched, I don't know if you saw the Breakfast with the Stars on the Epsom when they were showing the video. And he came around the corner on the camber with Herovian, I think it was. And like, he just did not look level, like coming around Epsom. He was a bit all over the place. And I'm not sure this track is going to suit him at all. So obviously they're, they're all like hunches. I know there's a lot of people who are on big prices, like 20, 25, 33s. If you're on those sort of prices, brilliant. But at the moment, you're not looking at them. He's five to one favourite. He's almost, well, 11 to two. He's in amongst passenger and military order. Um, so I think he's short enough for, it's not that he won't be a good long-term prospect. I just don't think this is his sort of test that he wants. And it seems that way. And also with Frankie, if if the horse isn't feeling it, like as in if he doesn't want the fast ground or whatever, or he comes across from 13, tucks him in behind and he's not getting there, you won't give the horse a hard run. They'll take him to somewhere like Royal Ascot or over to France and stuff. So, yeah. So on to the front three. And the front three, they are my three that I've backed anti-post. So Passenger is now six to one. I put that up at, well, it was 16 to one everywhere. And 20 to 1 in a place. Um, some people can't get the 20 to 1. Some can. So if you're on it, brilliant. Um, but the bottom line with Passenger was it was the whole Desert Crown, going to the Dante. It was just a very strange prep. I don't know whether Stout's confident because he did it last year. But it's very unlike Stout. He dropped him straight into the Wood Ditton, which is a listed class race. Um, uh, sorry, it's not listed. It's a maiden stakes, but it's a class three where he beat Katab and New Business, who I thought would both be quite good horses. They've been beaten since, but they were beaten by that monster Mostar Bashir, 
um, that potentially might end up in the St. James Palace for um, John Gosden. So they're eight, say 85 rated horses, or they will be once they get their mark. Um, but he then went to the Dante, and that's the reason why, obviously, he sat here at five, six to one. I mean, again, I'm not going to go deep into the ride because everyone saw it in the fact that you go back and watch that ride again and it looked like there was only one winner. And I think the biggest problem with the Dante is the Dante is a trial. And there were so many reasons why it was such an important trial for passenger. They paid £14,000 for him to run in that race. If he'd won it, he would have got into the Epsom Derby. Instead, they've had to pay, I think, I think it's something like £86,000 um, to supplement him for this event instead. So obviously that's a signal intent. Let's just have a look, quick look at the prize money to see where he would have to place. Okay, it's not on this page. Um, well, the prize money to the winner is eight hundred and eighty-five grand. So I'd imagine if he's in the first four or five, then they'll be getting their money back. Um, but obviously it's a big gamble. But they paid 14000 to get in the Dante to see where they were at with that horse. And obviously with the opportunity of getting in to the, the Derby. But the reason why it was such an issue was because not only did you not win it to get in and to get the prize money. Because obviously if you'd won it there, the I think the prize money was something like 150 k there. Yeah, 109000 there. So even if you were, I think, I'm sure, I'm sure the Dantes are winning you're in. But if it's not, you would have paid your supplementary fee regardless. Um, but the fact that he didn't, it wasn't just the fact that the money side of things and having to pay it separately. It was the fact you did not learn enough. Like, I'm a big fan of this horse and obviously I still hope he's, and think he's got a very big chance in the derby. But I don't know what he's got off the bridle. We saw him in the wood didn't, but that was only off eight furlongs. Like he was held onto like he was pulling a car at ten and a half furlongs at York. And in that last furlong, like why the jockey took another pull when uh, uh, Murphy came alongside him and he went left, he blocked him in and then went. The, a small gap opened up and he had the chance and he took another pull. It was almost like one of those handicap moments when you knew a horse over an island was trying to get handicapped for a big race. And it was just like, why have you took that last final pull? And obviously it's easy saying that I'm not a jockey. And at the end of the day, he's come and hold his hands up. And that's the worst thing. Like you, you can't, you shouldn't stand there and say that. Um, so at the end of the day, they didn't learn anything. If, if he had had that clear run, if he took the same route as the Foxes, say if you switch them round, he got the outside berth and he took the Foxes path, would he have won and gone away and absolutely blitzed them? Quite possibly. Would he have pushed off the bridle and then found very little and then still not got up? And something like the Foxes would have gone through his gap and they would have won. You just don't know. So all you can go on is the 95% that we of that race that we did get to see. He looks an easy ride. He looks very professional. He looks very relaxed. This sort of phase isn't going to, this isn't going to phase him. He's berthed in stall seven, which is a perfect draw. You want around the seven to 12, uh, possibly seven to 11. Um, he's, he's basically, everything's in his favour to run a big race. He will have no excuses. He shouldn't be getting boxed in again, especially down that Epsom straight. It's like, I think it's three or four furlongs long. It is ginormous. And if you're boxed in, not just a start, the whole way down, he's one that's got a turn of foot. It's just how much stamina he's got to go with that turn of foot. He's by Ulysses, who improved with age, but also wasn't. Some of his best performances were at 12 furlongs when chasing home and able. So he's got everything in his favour. And he is that sexy, unexposed horse that people will be like, oh, he's a, he's only that. But, but he has got, there is plenty behind it. You're not just backing it as form. And his form, even though he finished third, that's still great form. Um, so there's, there's nothing not to like about him in my opinion um, we just don't know what he finds off the bridle but that's no different to a lot of these because a lot of these come in very inexperienced he's currently 6 to 1 he's not 16 or 20s but I could easily see him getting that little drift if the money comes for a rest and that starts coming I could easily see Pastor coming out 7, 8 to 1 and if you can get 8 to 1 again like, like 7, 8 to 1 I think that's fair more than fair 6 to 1 is probably fair um, but obviously I'm biased so on to the next one, and that's military order. So this horse for me, since August Rodin flopped in the 2000 guineas, this horse to me has been the Epsom Derby winner in my view. Um, just because I, I just got, there was many things that I got very, very like, het, het, not het up on, or like caught up with. The main thing obviously, he is, again, he's a Frankel, um, but the main thing was the whole Adiar connections and the fact that he just strikes me very, very similar to Adiar. In that he's really bone idle. He looks like he's not bothered, like lazy. You can imagine him sleeping at home, just eating his food, going to sleep, eating his food, going to sleep. What do you want me to do? 
do the bare minimum sort of thing. And that's the way they've campaigned him. They've campaigned him just like his brother in the fact that they've just brought him along slowly. And he goes out in front and he literally, just, to be honest, he looks a perfect St. Ledger horse. So if he doesn't win here and he runs really well, St. Ledger, I'd imagine, will be his for the taking. Obviously, if he flops, then that's different. But I, I like he just looks like that sort of horse where he could just go on and on and on. Um, and originally, I thought maybe he was a St. Ledger horse until Lingfield. So just a quick flip back of some of his earlier form. Obviously, la last year, standard Appleby approach at Newmarket, sent off short price, 4 to 5, beaten in a maiden. Next time, same again, 8 to 11, wins a maiden. Standard Appleby procedure. Comes back this year, though, steps straight into 10 furlongs uh, on soft ground. And unlike many of these where they haven't got much substance to the form, even though it was only a five-runner race, he beat Exoplanet. So Exoplanet of Roger Variance has since gone on to finish third in the uh, Gold Cup at Newbury. And I think that race is going to be very strong with Bertinelli, um, Bold Act, uh, Forca Tameo. I think that's going to be a very strong race going forward. And he's now already rated 97. Um, and then in behind was Chesapeake. And Chesapeake has since won as well um, over at York, beating Land Legend, another horse I think is well handicapped, achieving 105 RPR. So these aren't trees that he's beaten. They're not world beaters, but they're not trees that he's beaten. Um, and he absolutely destroyed them, like as in washing line job, four lengths to Exoplanet, and it was about coming off the bridle, just workmanlike from the front. And then we go on to the Lingfield trial. So I genuinely thought, from draw five, I thought he'll be quick away, he'll hit the front, and he'll just keep him there, and away he'll go. And absolutely no issue. And that happened. He draw five, he was quick away, he sat on the outside, keen not to get boxed in, and he just sat in the second row behind the leader. The leader was the Regal Empire of James Tate's horse. And I thought, this is set up perfectly for him. He'll just peel the outside and go. And then Frankie was, you could see Frankie was trying to make the effort to try and keep him pinned. Like, oh, just do a little bit more, do a little bit more. Um, but I just didn't think Frankie would sacrifice his chance to, to keep this horse in. And he did. Frankie went out of his way to go three wide to keep military order in. So military order, instead, of, he went from perfect position to the worst position in the race at the most critical time. So coming to the bend, he was suddenly hemmed in and he had nowhere to go. He had a horse in front of him, the James Tate horse, that was clearly going backwards and actually finished seventh. And he had Frankie on the outside who was pushing along, but just the literal pure and simple keep him in. And Wipiro, who was also there, but who was gone. Wipiro was about to hit the bend. And Buick threw an absolute brilliant, obviously, well, brilliant initiative, hence why he's a champion jockey. He was like, no. And he went, he took the Darren route and went up the inside rail. If that door got closed, there was no way he was coming back around. But he got up the inside route, Darren route, and he went from the worst position in the race to the best position in the race like that. And then bang, the race was his. And he went he went up there and obviously Wipiro drew a line. And I think Wipiro headed him. And it was like a lesser horse could have just put, said, no, nah, not having it. And then, and then uh, but he battled back and he won going away. So this is the difference between a horse like Military Order and Passenger is that military order has said I've had a battle. So if military order, if you're coming down that cam if you're coming down that camber at Epson, if you get the likes of a, a like a um well Wipiro, but say if you get passenger, passenger cruising on the bridle, and passenger's cruising along the bridle against a military order, comes off the bridle, and military order's there, and, and there's nothing to say that passenger, once he starts getting pushed and he's like goes past military order, there's nothing to say military order's not going to go no mate and then and then keeps going as in he keeps battling he knows he he likes a battle he he's already had one whereas a horse like pasture pasture could then be heading and be like i don't know what to do obviously different horses you don't know until they get there but you know this horse is what he's going to do he is going to fight he's not going to lie down and that's what i like about this horse but the biggest thing that i really liked about military order was the fact that a lot of people said yeah but he had the easy run and he did have the easy run in the end but the bottom line was the reason he had the easy run was because he had the speed to take that gap. There's a lot of 12 furlong horses, especially around Lingfield. Everything about Lingfield, sharp track, should not have suited this horse. And it didn't. But he had the speed to take that gap. And again, you could go back to Passenger. Obviously, I'm knocking another horse that I've backed. But you could go back to Passenger and say, why didn't he have the speed to nip through this gap or to do this or to do that? Like, say if that gap had opened up for Passenger at Lingfield, would he have been quick enough? My gut says, yeah, he would have. But at the same time, you don't know that. And the fact that he was quick enough, but he also enjoyed that battle. And, the, and also that was over 12 furlongs. So there's no issue with stamina. And that's why I said you've got Wipiro and Military Order. Both of them, they like a battle and, and, and maybe they're not too far between, behind them. And he has been my low sight winner. The only negative I have, obviously with his connections of ADR, perfect, like loads of, loads of positives. The only negative is the Appleby Yard. 
Charlie Appleby has a quiet May normally, but he also has normally a very high strike rate. You're talking like 25% plus. Um, and he had a winner yesterday at four to five, but he's currently only running at a 13% strike rate and he's had plenty of horses beating up short prices recently. That's not his fault. Cause obviously plenty go off short prices regardless of their chances because of the yard, because they're that good. But he's only had 44% horses run to form in the last two weeks. But as I said, a lot of the time when it comes to group ones and big races, the big horses still perform. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But the difference is again, is going back to like the last week, you've got horse like Little Big Bear that have grown an extra leg and they can run to 105%, whereas Military Order might only be able to run to 100%. So at the prices, he's still the, the horse I like the most in the race. Um, but obviously, at the same time, you would have liked to have seen. But I say this, but by tomorrow, Appleby, he's got a favourite in the first on Saturday. He's going to have some big chances tomorrow. If he's got a horse that finished second and third and he's had a winner here and a winner there, before you know it, military order might be getting back. The other, the other way is if they've ran like drains, military order could be six or seven to one. Does that make him less of a bet? No. But at the same time, it just obviously puts that doubt in your mind. So on to the finale. The finale is August Rodin, the absolute Marmite horse. People are obviously, some are saying, what are you thinking? You cannot physically back that horse. Others are saying he cannot physically be beaten. And that there is no real in-between of nine out of ten people, to be honest. People are literally just straight up, that, that, is, that is the difference. Those that love him can't have him beat. Those that are against him. I'm going back to military order, another plum draw. And August rode in, plum draw again. So all three. August rode in, I looked at the bet slip earlier and I backed him on June the 26th last year. So it was almost 12 months ago. He was 14 to 1. I put him on Twitter. It was before he ran um, at Nace, I think it was. Yeah, 2nd of July he ran in Nace um, when he beat Shadowed at 1 to 3 on. Um and obviously I thought I was onto a winning slip and it was easy easy money coming up to the guineas and he was six to four, two to one for the derby. And obviously since then he's gone all the way out to sevens and now he's back at five to two, three to one. Me personally, I think he should be at least four to one if you were looking at backing him now. Um but the the problem is you you just you really don't know. He's got a brilliant draw, he's got brilliant two year old form, he's got the best two year old form. Um the, the beating in, in the futurity of the likes of Epicetus is not worked out at all. Um, but everything that he did as a two-year-old just looked impressive and like he was going to grow into it. It was all on soft and heavy ground. I think he'll improve for faster ground. Um, on, the, on the stamina front, he's got no stamina issues. Deep impact out of Rhododendron. Um, Rhododendron, who obviously finished second in the Oaks. Um, and it, on the stamina index, he's one of the best suited to this. Um, there's, there's just very little not to like by his 2000 guineas run take that out and he'd probably be coming here at 6 to 4 2 to 1 Vayne O'Brien has said oh we've had an issue and we're coming straight to the derby instead um, but it's it's just how you interpret that would I be surprised if he absolutely whopped this field no would I be surprised if he finished almost pulled up no the problem is I don't think this is that great a race that's the bottom line. I think there's a lot of horses in here that are could be good horses and maybe future good horses, but they may not be well suited to this. Whereas I think Military Order and August Rodin set a very high standard between them and what they've already achieved. And obviously August Rodin is already a Group 1 winner at the age of two. This was always going to be the plan. It was always about the 12 furlongs. I know they were talking about the Triple Crown and stuff, but that was just you know chatter like they like to do. And I just think he's got a massive chance. I, I'm not going to stand here and tell you he hasn't. I'm not going to... Um, I, and I, I do think he's still got a massive chance. There's, there's a lot to forgive. And obviously you go through the stats and there's going to be none that says to you a horse wins a derby off such a poor prep. But at the same time, like I've seen a lot of people mention it, like the Fasal Vega and the Supreme Novice. I don't think that's anything like this. Um, that It really is, is not anything like this. Like the flat horses are very different. Like they can run a really bad race and a week later they can they can run next level. They just recover so much quicker. They don't take three, four, five, six weeks to recover. And August Roden could be working with whatever he likes at home. And we saw what happened last weekend with all of his runners. Every single runner ran out of its skin. So I'd be shocked if this horse does not run a big race. And if you look at the Dante, like me personally, I don't think that's a good Dante. I think Pasture was the best horse in it, but it's not a good Dante. And that would knock out like Passenger, the Foxes, White Birch. If you're going on collateral, that would knock out Sprawl. And then you look down, you've got like a load of 40 and 50 to 1 winners. So you've only got Wipero, White Birch, Dubai Mile, 
So if you're going for the Dante, you've got white, white birch, the foxes and the passenger. So if that form's not that great, you've then got Sprawl, um, who ties in with white birch on form lines. And you've then got Dubai Mile and Arrest, who are collateral to each other. Like, and then it's suddenly you're like, okay, you've got August Road. Like, I just don't think it's the best derby. Like, I don't think you'll be looking back and thinking, this is an amazing derby. So me personally, my bets are August Road down at 16 to 1, Military Order at 7 to 1, and um, Passenger at 16 to 1. Would I change any of those? No, I wouldn't. Is there a way to back all three of those? Potentially. Um, but at the, at, the, at the same time, I'm not here to tell you how or why. Um Military order, if you told me one horse in the race, that would be military order. And if you wanted a long shot, it would be Waipiro. If you wanted two long shots, it would be Waipiro and Dubai Mile, just because I think they're overpriced. If you wanted a forecast, it would be military order and Waipiro, but that's just because of their form. It's not because I think they're the best two. And I think the best three horses, for all different reasons, are the three that I've got. So apologies if that does or doesn't help. Um, but that's my view. And the rest, and yeah, I'm not a fan of the rest for this race. So here we go. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, the Prosperous Voyage race. So the Prince Elizabeth Phillies and Mares race. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but I've said about John Gosden and Phillies that his stable was really out of form um, when they when they came back um, uh, from a new market and this horse completely bombed. Sent off 40 to 1, ran no race. But prior to that, I had finished only six lengths behind Creative Flair, which was only five lengths behind the likes of Via Sestina. Villa de Grace was in front, and this horse, Shara, I'm talking about, had already beaten Villa de Grace. So at 10 to 1, she might be worth like a pound each way or something like that. I don't know what the each way places will be. Um, I just think there's kinks in Prosperous Voyage. She, she's run, she's won at Epsom, but she's run enough poor races. Potter Pover obviously bled last time. Um, and... Roman Mist and Astral Bureau set fair levels, but they're not world beaters, so just want a bigger price. So, we've got two more bets for today. Try and keep it short. Um, so, the first one is into the 355, the Leicester Piggott handicap, and that is Cadaval. Put simply, it's the Andrew Bolden effect. He's won two of the last three renewals. So I went back and looked at his 2019 winner, Ladon de Vie. Um, he sent he sent that horse here um, at Epsom to win the novice uh, the novice event, which was about five weeks ago. Um, won it off a very similar mark to his runner today is twelve to one shot, which is Cadaval. Um, he won he won same sort of very similar race from the front, made not made all but um, won from the front got put up the mark and ended up coming here off a mark of none other than I have to scroll all the way back through came here off a mark of 86 ran off a mark of 86 hit an RPR of 100 and the rest was history won very easily so his runner here Cadavar runs off a mark of 86 having won the exact same event that that horse did in 2021 um sorry 2019 so runs off the same mark if it runs to like the level of 100 or something like that obviously there's no guarantee but when she ran here at epsom over eight and a half furlongs she won by nine and a half lengths beating hey lila hey lila has won since so it's not like beating trees but it's not spectacular form she did bomb um when when running against uh, in a Howden handicap at Newmarket, ran no race, but that could have been by design just to knock the mark down a bit. Booking of William Buick says that obviously it's got intent. I was quite surprised to see Oyson Murphy wasn't booked, but he might still have ties to the um, connections of the Gosden horse. So Cadavar for me with Bolden's great record. And the other one I liked in this was Forca Tomeo, 14 to 1 shot. As I said before, quite simply, I think the Newbury Gold Cup form will be strong with Boldak, Exoplanet um, and Bertinelli. And this horse only finished one and a half lengths off those. Comes here off a mark only uh, one pound higher. Ran a brilliant race there. Just wasn't as good as some of the others. And I think if this horse can get involved again with that experience, good use at 14 to 1. Like there's plenty you can make a case for, but two at double figure prices. Cadavar and Forza de Mayo. Um, and then finally, my final selections for the Epsom event. Apologies, it's taken so long. Um, my final selections for the Epsom event is uh, Caius Chorister. Um, 
and the reason is for that is I just think the horse could be uh, higher than a handicapper. Um, obviously ran up a sequence last year. Epsom form is rock solid. All the first and seconds in them. One back to back here, two runs in a row. Um, again, Ryan Moore's been booked rather than Bruno de la Siet. Um and ran a brilliant race behind um, KS Chorus, uh, Brian KS Chorus, uh, behind Bad Company when beating the likes of Fantastic Fox and Scampy. Scampy obviously won that York race since. Um, I just think the horse remains still well handicapped, steps back up to um, in trip, steps up to 12 furlongs. Um, and I just think it's got plenty in its favour and it's still got room, wiggle room in the mark off 72. But the one I really like is Max Mayhem who came from Joseph O'Brien and has moved to um, Kevin Philippart de Foy. Um, and it looked no, they, they sent him to Kempton. Um, and the horse, the reason I got drawn to this horse was because if anyone can remember back at Newmarket, the horse I bought was HMS President. Um, that horse finally got off the mark, winning and is now rated three pound higher. That was a competitive, very good handicap, which probably is a lot better than this race. Um, but that horse finished second to Max Mayhem. If you go back and watch Max Mayhem, came from almost at the back, pulled out alongside, and it was such a brilliant ride by um, Benoit de la Sillette in the fact that he cruised to the front and he made it look like he was struggling to go past. But <coughs> in reality, he was just doing enough the whole way to the line. Just nudge, little nudge, little nudge. And then comes up here and is only up four pounds. So ben Benoit de la Sillette is back on board again. And straight away, you read the quotes from before, and after that race in Kempton, so that was back in April, the connection said that they are targeting this race. So the fact that you're targeting this race that far out, I think at 13 to 2, you can get 13 to 2 each way, four places, there's only nine runners in this race. So I just think that's strong form of the fact HMS President has won since, has come across from Joseph's yard, so they may have unlocked more. They've targeted this race, they've gone for the fast ground. He looked like he had plenty in hand at Kempton when taking that competitive affair. And that was a strong RPR of 101. And I just think they're holding on to plenty here. So 13 to 2 each way there. And then Caius Chorister, who I think is a potential group horse and a handicap and has got 2 for 2 at Epsom and loves it around the quirky track from the front. Um, and he's 7 to 2, so 7 to 2 win bet. So that is everything for Epsom. So that is a, an awful lot of horses, an awful lot of selections. Uh, quick summary of, uh, of the Epsom Derby. I'm sticking with my horses or uh, military uh, military order if you're just having one but obviously I've got military order pasture and August Roden if you want ones at a bigger price it would be Wipero and Dubai Mile but obviously that is five horses in the race but the reasons are is because they've got good form finishing behind others um, then we go to what was the other races uh, we go to the Leicester Piggott Handicap and we've got Cadavar for Andrew Baldin hopefully he can win it three times in four years and Forca Tomeo and the other one is uh, Caius Chorister, hopefully a group horse in a handicap, and Max Mayhem, who I think has an absolutely massive chance of trainers that have been targeting this for so long. So, hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the Epsom Derby, enjoy the FA Cup final, and have a brilliant weekend, and I'll speak to you soon.